Harris and the New Thought Messengers. Thank you so much. Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome, welcome to the New Thought Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Shannon O'Hurley. I get to be your senior minister here in this beloved spiritual community. We are dedicated to doing our own work and then living that out into the world to help make it a better place for all people, all people everywhere. Speaking of all people, if you are here for the first time, know that we have mindfully and we have thoughtfully created a place just for you, exactly as you are this day, this moment, this minute, this second, this instant. You are in the right place. There is great love here, great love here for you. As we do every week, we take a moment and ground ourselves with our land acknowledgement. So for you online, just know that we here in Lake Oswego, we do this every Sunday to acknowledge the land that we are on. We acknowledge that we are on the land of the Kalapuya people and we affirm indigenous history, experiences and sovereignty. I want to take a moment also and acknowledge our online practitioner hosts, our beloved Cindy Gomez and Beth Doyle. Thank you so much for holding the space online in the very same way that our practitioners hold the space, this holy place here in the room, in the sanctuary. If you want to find out more information about who we are, what we are, how we are, I invite you to visit our website, newthoughtcsl.org. For those of you here in person, there's information on our information tables in the lobby and downstairs. I want to take a moment and remind you, if you haven't already, to please silence your cell phones, those of you who are here. I mean, we don't mind when God calls, but it's nice to, you know, uh, <laughs> silence the phones in the room. And as always, with one voice here in our beloveds, wherever you are watching from, let us with one voice share our vision and our mission. Our vision, recognizing our oneness, we envision a world that works for everyone and all creation and our mission providing spiritual tools for personal and global transformation. So with that, I am going to invite our beloved practitioner, Terry, up for our opening blessing. Thank you, and good morning. Oh, I'm so grateful that each one of us is here today in person, uh, in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary of your own home, welcome. And this is our time to just settle into our space now, to just bring ourselves fully present to the here and the now and all that it offers. So if you're comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes or you can cast them down and just take a few gentle breaths. And as you do so, bring in the peace that is here now in this space and release anything that is coming up that can just hold off for a bit. Any concerns, any hurts, just allow them to just be released for our time here together. For what I recognize and know to be truth is that we are gathering here for a reason. We are called forth to companion, to work with, to co-create our lives and this is sacred and it is divine and i'm so grateful that each one of us has brought ourselves here to be blessed with the music and the meaning to be blessed with the offering the message that rev shannon will be sharing with us 
to be blessed by the readings, everything, all of the feelings that are coming up in this space of New Thought Center for Spiritual Living, I bless it and I am profoundly grateful for it. And I bless our music team, blessing the audiovisual team that makes all of that stuff in the background work beautifully, perfectly. I bless B and all of the volunteers who are out with the children. I bless the ministry, the practitioners, the volunteers, the greeters. There is so much so much power going on, so much love going on to orchestrate this moment here now. And I recognize that the divine is in it. And so blessing this time together, I just rest, breathe easy, and allow it to be. And so it is. And as we move into our time of spiritual prayer, our time together to sing, if you feel comfortable, please rise and join in in the music.
So, a couple of months ago, we began a very special tradition in the life of our community. The first Sunday of every month, we want to support those of you here in the room and those of you online who are moving through the experience of grief. Grief, bereavement, anticipatory grief, loss. Whatever that may be, we have intentionally decided to do this as the beloved community in order for you to know that you are not alone and that you are fully, fully supported. And so what I'd like to invite you to do now, those of you who are moving through grief here at home, I'd like you to take a deep breath and gently close your eyes. And the rest of us will support you by extending the following blessing to you. So those of us who are speaking this blessing as always, we will repeat it three times. So let's all take an easy deep breath. You, beloved, are not alone in this. We are with you. We hold your grief with love, and we surround you in grace as you make your way through this tender time. You, beloved, are not alone in this. We are with you. We hold your grief with love, and we surround you in grace as you make your way through this tender time. You, beloved, are not alone in this. We are with you. We hold your grief with love, and we surround you in grace as you make your way through this tender time. And so it is. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Shannon. Now it is a treat for me to introduce our good friend, Glenn Hoover. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hey. One second. Oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. It's okay. Barb, take it away. It's all right, it's okay. We love you, Brian. <laughs> the following reading is a poem by Shalann Harkin. It's called Better Things to Do. God isn't some hovering weirdo. The divine entity must have better things to do than frown upon every ignorant deed. Surely this God is more interested in the magical generative works of luring things to toward the light. Break your mental images of God, those fearful little knickknacks that line the shells of your mind and go on and let this God thing become a great mystery within the unfolding sunrise in your heart. And so it is. Amen. Thank you, Barb. And now, Glenn Hoover. Well, I 
Kate Kuypers, the New Thought Messengers. Ah, y'all are awesome. Ah, hello, beloveds. So, um, you know, this is the Sunday that it follows Easter. And it's always such an interesting time. You know, because last Sunday, uh, you know, it was Easter. We had the choir, and we had all the practitioners here and online, and we had the kids' carnival, and it was bright colors, and it was all the things, and I told a couple of extra stories, and we had guest vocalists. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a celebration, a big, big thing, right? And then the Sunday after kind of reminds me of like, you know how when you have a really great dinner party, and everyone leaves, and you sit down on your couch, before you start cleaning up, and you just feel the love in your home. This is like that. We get to bask in the love of our home today. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of, of beauty, there's a lot of grace in that. And that is why I'm talking about today, the title of my talk is How We Partner With the Divine so that we can continue that love. We can continue feeling that connection. So um, the three things that I want to talk about today, the first is that Truly, there is no one way to experience the divine. In whatever faith tradition you follow, and the great news is that here in New Thought, we follow the great ancient wisdom of so many beautiful faith traditions, in particular the mystical aspects of the, those faith traditions. And we have an opportunity to pay homage to that. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. We also... The second thing I want to talk about, about how we partner with the divine, is how we cultivate a profound relationship with spirit from the inside. And I want to talk about that in a greater way, and in a way that I have not yet talked about here before. And then the third thing that I want to talk about is how we are supported at all times by the universe, source, God, love, quantum consciousness, whatever word works for you, how we are continuously being supported, not only supported, but urged and nudged in the direction of having a very profound, ongoing conversation with God. So the first thing I want to talk about is the concept of an altar. So an altar really simply means a raised place. It's a raised place where we are reminded of God. It's the place where God and humanity are expressed on the outside world in a very specific way. So here at the New Thought Center, as I just mentioned, we follow the wisdom of the great faith traditions. And I wanted to show you our interfaith altar. Sometimes it gets lost in this big space. We always bring it up here for the month of December. We have a beautiful interfaith uh, uh, holiday season. But I wanted to show you, this is our expression of gratitude, our reminder of divinity. And it's just this sweet thing that humans do. And we've done it for millennia. Every great tradition had a fo one form or another of an altar, by the way, in some way, in some way. So here on the altar, we've got earth-based religion, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity represented. And then if you look up here behind me to our banner, which also sometimes gets lost, we have a reminder. It's like another kind of altar on our banner right here. Of, it continues on. Taoism, 
Shintoism, Islam, Sikhism, New Thought. This is our outward expression of all the ways, all the ways through millennia, humanity has experienced the divine. There is no wrong way to pray. There is no wrong way to experience God. Hafiz, the great Sufi poet, wrote, I am in love with every church and mosque and temple and any kind of shrine because I know it is there that people say the different names of the one God. So we have this opportunity in our partnership with the divine to create an outward expression. Now I know that many of you who've been here for a long time, you have altars in your home of various kinds. And let me be really clear, an altar can be simply uh, a beautiful photograph on a shelf, right? It does not have to be fancy. It could be, when we do retreats, a lot of times I will ask folks to go out into nature and feel something that inspires them and bring that, maybe it's a stone or a flower, something that speaks to their soul and place that on our altar in the center of our circle, right? It's, it's not complicated. But for those of you who maybe haven't paid attention to your altars in a while, don't have one, are a little bit like Shannon, this is way woo-woo. Um, I do want to let you know that I have made a commitment to myself to normalize the woo-woo. Are you good with that? Like, I'm done. Like, we're just, this is who we are, okay? Because it's not. People have had altars for thousands of years. You know, you can, why, why I have altars all over, and I can walk through a certain room and something reminds me, oh, take a breath, Shannon Eileen. Take a minute, slow down, honey. Remember the truth that's happening here. So I just invite you this week to consider either dusting off the altar that you have, adding to it, rearranging, do a little DIY, and see how that uplifts you and see how that brings to your mind when you see it, how it reminds you of the divine. It's a lovely spiritual tool from the ancients. So, in 1924, in Paris, France, a little boy was born. His name was Jacques Lucéron. Jacques Lucéron. When he was seven and a half, he was in his classroom and there was a little scuffle and he fell on the edge of a desk and it blinded him. He went completely blind. Now think, if you would, to Paris around that time. So people who were blind were often sent to the margins of society. They were sent off away to a school for the blind. There was really not a future for them, so to speak. But his parents refused to succumb to that idea. They refused, they refused. And they refused to pity him, and they demanded that he stay in his public school. And his public school actually made accommodations for Jacques. Totally unheard of at that time. They got him a bigger desk so that he could have his braille uh, uh, materials, and he had a Braille typewriter and a regular typewriter, so he could learn on both. His parents learned Braille. As soon as he was experiencing this and coming home, his father said to him, I want you to tell me about everything you learn in your new world. What a difference. Thankfully, his parents were students of the spiritual teacher Rudolf Steiner, who some of you may know created the holistic and gentle Waldorf education, which at that time it was desperately needed for children. And so Jacques thought of this whole circumstance in his mind, talk about a reframe, as an adventure, as an adventure to to learn a new way of being in the world. And learning a new way of being in the world, he did. He became the top student of his class. 
he discovered that without his sight, he had this ability within him to lean into the light, into the inner presence within himself. He called it his inner light, his inner love. The Quakers call divine wisdom the inner light. And he deeply resonated with that. The fact that he could no longer see his outer world allowed his other senses to be heightened. And one of the senses that was profoundly heightened within him was his sense of intuition, his God voice, as the mystic Ernest Holmes used to say, his God voice. And so he began this relationship with his inner divinity, this partnership with his inner divinity. He was in constant communication with it. He even said at a very young age that he could recognize that when he was in a place of anger and frustration, he did not experience as much inner light because it went away. He said that when he mindfully was in a place of love and lived from that place, he had a whole world of light within him. He became so attuned that he would be able to stand in front of trees and he would be able to know if it were a willow or an oak tree because of the sound the leaves would make through the wind in the trees. That's how attuned he became. He also became an incredible judge of character because he didn't have eyes that could distract him. He only had the energy field that he could pay attention to and tune into. And so he grew to become this very uh, intuitive teenager. He knew intuitively that there was danger approaching from Nazi Germany. He wanted to understand it and be prepared, so he taught himself German. And by the time he was 17 years old, the Nazis had invaded France. He immediately mobilized as many people as he could, and he created a resistance army, if you will. And he became the person within this large group in France who would decide whether people could join the resistance or not. And he did it purely by his intuition. Thousands of people came to sit with him, and he would interview them. And he went completely by the divine guidance of his inner light, his intuition, whether he let them in or not. He was 17 years old. The Nazis never suspected because they were teenagers, so they were able to do a lot. The uh, underground resistance created a newspaper, a bi-weekly newspaper that was distributed to over 250,000 people at that time. Think about that. Of the thousands of people that he interviewed, he allowed 600 in to this resistance uh, uh, community, if you will. He said there was one young man that he had a doubt about. His name was Elio, but he let him in anyway. And Elio ended up betraying him and the entire uh, resistance army of his. Thankfully, thankfully, Jacques refused to write down any of the contact information for all of the people. He memorized all of their addresses and phone numbers in his head, the hundreds and hundreds of them. So if this ever happened, he would be able to protect them. Moving forward, he was arrested and sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. There were 2,000 people there at the time. He spent the first six months uh, in a cell that was four by three feet. He writes in his memoir, There Was Light, that he was able to tune into the sounds and the light and the divinity within him, and that is what helped him survive. Of those 2,000 people, when France was finally liberated two years later, there were 30 survivors. To survive a concentration camp is an extraordinary thing. To survive a concentration camp as a blind person is on a whole other level. Part of what he was able to do because he understood German is he knew what was happening. 
He considered his job, he considered his job once he was, he was let out of that cell after six months, he considered his job was to uplift and share his inner light with all of those around him. He was an extraordinary, extraordinary man. He wrote, there is only one world. Things outside only exist if you go to meet them with everything you carry in yourself. There is only one world. Things outside only exist if you go to meet them with everything you carry in yourself. He understood at such a young age that partnering with the divine was how he would survive and thrive. And I believe this is a message for all of us. So not only is it so very important that we honor all the different ways that we might experience the divine. And what we don't have on our altar here are mm, walks in nature, tea with a trusted beloved friend, laughter on the carpet with little ones, accomplishing, finishing a task that's taken a long time to do. There are so many ways to experience God. The thing is, these two things go together. The inner and the outer are one divinity. So that is how we can partner with the divine, recognizing that our inner light is available to us at every moment. And we forget that, don't we? We just do. Or we have a really fine time remembering it when things are going great. Anybody? Your life is going great, and you're like, I'm going to go to church today. <laughs> but I have to tell you in my experience, oftentimes when things are really tough and really hard, people will often not come to church. They will not join online. And this is the most important time for them to do so. So I share that with all of you just to plant that seed for whatever way that might serve and support you. Oftentimes when we are hesitant to join spiritual community, it's the time when our soul might need it the most, right? So this inner light, cultivating this inner light, Jacques was the absolute master at this. Just what an incredible teacher of how to do that. So part of how we partner with the divine, Jacques talked about in when he was in the concentration camp and he was able to understand German and he would hear, he would hear what was happening through, through people. And he was able to support those around him. We are supported all the time through each other. We don't even know this. Now, part of the normalizing of the woo-woo, part of one of the things I want to normalize for us, and I talked about this a little bit last week, is the idea of normalizing the communication that is constantly happening between spirit, the universe, and us. It's an ongoing conversation. Some of us call it signs, right? I talked about it last week, how, normalizing how Mary Magdalene saw Jesus in the garden and how that's so normal and that it became this big, huge thing that seemed un, untenable for any of us. And yet, even in his death, Jesus was teaching us, you too will do this. So this idea of uh, signs, this idea of the communication that is constantly happening with us and for us. The great agricultural scientist and inventor, George Washington Carver wrote, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. And for those of you who've been in this teaching for a thousand years like me, 
I promise you, this is an ongoing spiritual practice. It's an ongoing spiritual practice. Now, I want to be very clear. A sign or divine communication has to be personal to you. It has to have meaning specifically to you. That's how it works. It's not like you walk out of your house and you go, oh, the sky is blue. My favorite color is blue. I am going to sell everything and buy a blue boat and sail around the blue ocean for the rest of my days. (laughs) Please do not do that. Please do not do that. Searching for signs, that's ego. That's grasping, that's reaching. And it requires discernment for us to be able to know the difference. So be gentle with yourself in this. I, I mean, I've done that before, where I've been like, okay, God, I'm, I'm waiting for this answer, I'm waiting for this thing, and then something will happen, I'll be like, ping, okay, I'm off to the races. And then upon reflection, I was like, no, was that really for me? No. No, I kind, of, I kind of put that circle into that box in order to make that fit. That's not this. That is not this. I invite all of you in this moment here and at home just, just to recall a time. It could have been the smallest thing or the largest thing where you had a nudge, an inner nudge, and you turned left in your life or you turned right in your life and you were led to the exact place you were meant to be. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I remember years ago in the early 90s, I was reading a book. It was a random book that I was reading and it had one line in there. And the one line in there spoke about a new thought community. And I'd never heard of that in my whole life, but my whole body, body got God bumps. I used to call them goosebumps back then. I call them God bumps now. You know when you know. You know when you know. So when I was deciding whether I was going to take this job, this position in in 2019, I wasn't sure. It was a big, big decision. And there was a lot going on. And I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. I was in discernment. And I was coming out of a grocery store. And there was a father and a daughter and they were talking. They looked like they had come from like a game, like a soccer game. They were wearing kind of gear, and he was wearing the team hat. And I was walking out, and I, the whole time I'd been in the store, I was having a conversation with Spirit, with God. I was like, all right, I just, I'm just going to ask for a sign. I just need a sign. Am I going to take this position or not? I just need guidance here. What am I to know here? And I walked out of the door. The, the sliding glass doors opened, and I, I stepped out. And the... The, the father and the daughter are walking out and the father goes, you just need to go. You need to take it. You just need to take it, honey. You need to go. <laughs> the reason that's so personally, has so much personal meaning for me is I have gone to my father for advice my whole life. I'm very, very close with him, hi, dad. Very close with him. And so it was that much more heightened. Do you see? When I prepare a talk, I start thinking about it for Sunday. I start thinking about Monday or Tuesday, and ideas are are coming through. My prayer is always, Spirit, give me the strength to get out of my own way so you can move through me and work through me. And so I was looking at this idea of inner light, and we talk about this all the time. And I had set the intention that I wanted a story that I did not know about to bring to you just another way Another way of saying the same thing we say all the time because maybe it might land in a different way in your body temple, in your heart. And so as I was discovering this incredible life of Jacques Lucéron, and I'm reading it and then I hear in my, here, I see, I read that he, you know, his parents were students of Rudolf Steiner and Steiner, of course, created the Waldorf School. My daughters, our daughters went to Waldorf. So, so th- I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. So then I keep going and I go to the deep dive of his life. He's written two books. Oh. I go to the deep dive and I discover that after he left the concentration camp, he went to the Sorbonne. He graduated top of his class, summa cum laude, He had to wait five years because there was a law in France at the time that people who were disabled were not allowed to be professors. He helped to change that law. That law was changed. He became a professor. 
there. I'm reading this and I'm, I'm thinking into the experience that he must have had. And then something happened. Okay, put that right over here. You know when you're in a class and someone, uh, the teacher might say, let's do an icebreaker, or maybe it's a retreat of some kind, and they say to you, oh, we're going to go around, introduce yourself, and just say something that's just kind of special about yourself, maybe something that people wouldn't assume. My go-to is the fact that I happened to have been born in Hawaii. Kind of a cool place to be born. Of all the places to be born, people vacation there. I was born in Hawaii. I have a deep, deep connection to the islands. My parents went to graduate school there. They got married there. I was born there. They used to go to the Newman Center. That was the hippy-dippy folk mass on the campus at the university, you know, with the, with the guitar and all the things. So I was, I was very much in that uh, experience with them at the University of Hawaii from the time I was a little baby. Um, you know, late, late 60s, early 70s, my parents were there. Jacques leaves the Sorbonne. I'm reading this earlier in the week. Leaves the Sorbonne and goes to the United States to teach at the University of Hawaii. You cannot make this up. I was there the same time he was there. I shared air with him. I shared air with him. The universe is continuously communicating to us. As soon as I read that, I was like, hot damn, that's what I'm talking about on Sunday. Thank you, God. I'm going to bring a little Jacques Luceron into the room. <laughs> but do you see? Do you see? It's happening all the time this communication with the divine, I invite you to pay attention. Pay attention and notice when it's personal to you. Something that is very personal to me is poetry, as many of you know. I love poetry. I find it to be an extraordinary way to experience God or the divine. And Back in 2020, I found this poet, her name is Shalan Harkin, and we've been reading a lot of her poetry here. I've been bringing it to you for years, and we're so excited that this Friday night, she is going to be here in this room, reading poetry, sharing from her heart. We're going to do a Q&A. She's written three books, book signing, all this wonderfulness. So I invite you this Friday night. It'll be a great evening. You can register online. Earlier, Barb read her poem, and I just want to reiterate it here for you because it speaks to everything we're unpacking today, called Better Things to Do. God isn't some hovering weirdo. The divine entity must have better things to do than frown upon every ignorant deed. Surely this God is more interested in the magical generative works of luring things toward light. Break your mental images of God, those fearful little knickknacks that line the shelves of your mind, and go on and let this God thing become a great mystery within the unfolding sunrise in your heart. We experience God from the inside out. We experience light from the inside out. I invite you to take that with you into your week. So, I'm going to invite the practitioners to come forward. Let's pray. I invite the practitioners online to join me in prayer as we anchor this time together. Let's all take a deep, nourishing breath. Just easy, easy. What a blessing it is to remember, to proclaim, to lean into, to stand in and to know this inner light, this inner divinity that has been with us since before we had a name or a face. God, spirit, source is the most true thing about us. It is an every 
Sound I hear, every being before me is spirit made manifest right here, is of the divine. And this divinity then must live and breathe within each one of us because there is no spot where God is not. It is eternal and always and forever this divine relationship. And so I just give so much thanks knowing this truth building on this truth, growing into this truth in an even greater way, knowing that each one of us has the opportunity to build our altar, to acknowledge the ways in which we experience the divine, to pay attention to the spiritual conversation the universe is consistently and continuously having with us. Oh, what a blessing it is to be here in this place in this grace, supporting each other and growing together. I bless all of our loved ones, our families, our friends that are family, knowing the same love is right where they are. I bless all people everywhere impacted by violence, war, injustice, pain, challenge, difficulty, knowing this love too is right where they are. And on this day, I bless all people who gather in churches, all people throughout the week who gather in mosques and ashrams and synagogues and temples and prayer meetings and planning meetings and yoga mats and hikes, knowing that we are all experiencing this divinity in our own way, and it is a gift from the beloved itself. So blessing all of this, I'm so filled with gratitude. I'm so filled with thanks. I allow this to be, and so it is. Blessed be. Blessed, blessed be. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is our time where we get to pay it forward. Everything we do is a result of what you give. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. For those of you who are not aware, you can text to give. You can go to our website, newthoughtcsl.org, and give there. I thank those of you who pledge. It helps us to plan. Thank you for all the ways you give in our community. So together with one voice, let us share this blessing. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. Thank you. Ain't no shame, ain't no gain, no blame, no dust fear, no one get hurt, no more pain. Say it myself, say it again. Ain't nothing wrong, ain't nothing fake. I'm feeling something, make no mistake. Lord have mercy, I'm 
been churched very well. Thanks. <laughs> I have four announcements. The first one is it's still not too late to sign up for Reverend Shannon's five-week certified class, which is based off of Deepak Chopra's book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. Uh, the first night was recorded, so you can still join and you can read that or watch that recording. Uh, it's Monday, 6.30, 8.30 p.m., and it's online and in person. So registration's downstairs at the desk, or you can do it on newthoughtcsl.org. And then there's three more, and the way I was remembering them is they're the next three Fridays. So uh, if that helps you remember the dates... The first one is uh, Shalann Harkins, this Friday, here and online, and you can buy the tickets online. And then, let's see, $25 for both in person and $30 at the door. And then the following Friday, we have, uh, it's, a, it's for our local folks. If on Friday, 7.30 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church in downtown Portland, and TCSL is one of the sponsors of an annual event, Earth Day in Music and Song 2024. The featured soloist is Michael Allen Harrison, which means it's, it will be amazing. And it includes instrumental and vocal performances, readings, candle lighting, and quiet reflection. If you'd like more information downstairs at our Earth Care team table, you can get more information in the community hall. And then lastly, is Joan, is Joan here? There she is, okay. So uh, this year, Joan Lubar is going to be facilitating, hosting our Passover with our Jewish community. She's going to be teaching about the Seder dinner, the Seder plate foods, and the meaning of all of the ritual around this. Oh, yes, it's a potluck. She'll provide the Seder plate foods, and then we all get to bring additional foods as a potluck. Uh, it'll be lovely. I attended it last year and have done similar things as a child, but to take it as an adult was really powerful. So thank you. Thank you, Joan, for all of that. Uh, there is on our website, or you can pick up a flyer on, at the info tables downstairs that suggests what foods to bring. Thank you, Terry. So much to look forward to. I want to take a moment and thank all of you who are here today who have helped to co-create, to partner with the divine this experience this morning. And all of you who have joined us online, thank you so, so very much. Uh, thank you to those of you who have joined us from Florida, Arizona, Colorado, California, Nebraska, Texas, and Oregon. Can we all turn around and just wave to these beloveds so that they see our love, they feel our love, they feel the divinity that is right here in this room. We're so grateful for all of you joining us. What a blessing. I wanna also 
once again thank our online practitioner moderators, Cindy Gomez and Beth Doyle. Thank you so very much. I want to invite the practitioners who are here in the room to come down to the front, if you would, as we prepare the sanctuary for a time of prayer. So practitioners, please come on forward. And those of you online, please know that, uh, that the practitioners there, Cindy and Beth, will be in a private breakout room and they are available to pray with you. Avail yourself of that. Those of you here, if there's anything on your heart at all, these beloveds are here to pray with you, to know the truth for you. What a gift they are. So I'm going to invite everyone to please stand as you are able for our final blessing. Once again, I look forward to seeing you Friday night. It's going to be such a rich, rich evening. If you, if you like uh, Rumi and Hafiz and Rilke, Shalan Harkin is the poet for you. Just know that she's of that ilk. So I look forward to sharing that with you. So let us say our final blessing. May you go in the light, as the light, and with the light. Until we meet again, may the long time sun shine upon you, all love surround you, and the pure light within you guide you on your way. You are so loved. Have a great week. Mwah. I release and I let go.